and welcome to the daily highlights at the Falling Walls and the Berlin Science Week. It's great to have you joining us. My name is Astrid Frohloff. I'm a TV moderator and journalist from Germany, and I have the great pleasure to lead you through the World Science Summit this year. So one thing that is really great about uh, the Science Summit is that amidst the uncertainty of the global pandemic, you will find here forward-driven solutions, future innovations and mind-opening thoughts in one world, very positive, constructive ideas for our common future. In the next hour, we want to give you an overview about our very exciting and very diverse program. You will learn about some highlights. You meet outstanding speakers and get a good sense of what you can expect and how to create your personal program for the next days. But first of all, let me introduce to you the person who is running and organizing everything, Felix Rundel, Executive Director, Falling Walls. Uh, Felix, you have been doing conferences since more than 10 years by now, I think. Now, for the very first time, the Falling Walls is completely virtual. It's a big change. Uh, what's different in organizing such an event? Hi, Astrid. Well, yes, um, 2020 was definitely the most challenging and demanding year we've had so far for the Berlin Science Week and for Falling Walls, but not just for us and our team of 100 people probably, with uh, including all the helpers. Um, we also connected with hundreds of partners internationally and made sure that we could bring together this massive program of over 200 events, more than 500 speakers for the next 10 wow. days. So now we're standing in front of this creation and uh, full of anticipation to start and really um, connect and, and bring all the people together this year. Yeah, and I guess you didn't catch much sleep during the last weeks, right? No, but that has really always been the same. The last uh, weeks before the conference were very demanding and stressful, but what's changed this year is also that all the meetings, all the preparations had to happen in a remote mode. So we spend a lot of hours on Zoom, obviously, like everyone else, and still I think we got into the mode and learn how to work effectively. It's a great experience for everybody, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, so thanks for the moment. I talk to you later, Felix, um, and we are looking forward to uh, what we can expect here during uh, the summit. The program is full of inspiring innovations from many different fields of science. And when you think science, this is not my world, you might recognize uh, during the program what we are presenting can have a very deep impact on our common future, I think. But now I'm very glad to introduce to you the person who is what you can tell the mastermind behind everything. I'm very glad to welcome Jürgen Mlünek. He is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Walling Walls Foundation and the coordinator of the Berlin Science Week. Nice to have you here, Hello, Mr. Mlünek. Let's have a look at the Berlin Science Week first of all. Um, what's actually the great idea behind it? Well, the great idea behind it is to bring a lot of people this year virtually to uh, science and innovation, to research um, as a, a very important goal for the future of uh, the society. So we will have a lot of events. Um, 200 events, a lot of speakers, uh, a large diversity. We have uh, virtual lab visits, we will have uh, quizzes, we will have panel discussions, symposia. So I think there will be a, a little bit for everybody. And maybe it's also somehow a distraction in these difficult times of uh, lockdowns. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's the first time that this uh, Falling Watts is uh, virtual and the Berlin Science Week as well. W what changed? What's different? Well, you know, we said already early this year, never miss a crisis. You always have to make the best out of uh, a situation. So we said, let's go virtual and let's try a completely different format not to do things within two days from early morning to late in the evening, but uh, to have something that already starts now and then, you know, you know uh, moves on until November 9 with a grand finale and probably we'll speak about that later on. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, we will do this. Um, let's talk about the Falling Walls program. What can we expect? Well, you know, what we tried this year is we choose a motto, breakthroughs of the year, Falling Walls 2020 remote. And what we did is we asked 
you know, the whole world, institutions, academies, companies, please tell us your breakthrough of the year in 10 different categories, the usual suspects like physical science, engineering, but also arts and science, digital education, emerging talents. We got nearly 1,000 nominations and uh, we had high uh, uh, ranked juries to make a selection, 10 winners in each category. So we will show the winners with you know, their contribution. And then again on November 9, in the final show, there will be the breakthrough in each of the category. Yeah, that's very exciting. Looking forward to it. Um, and what's amazing also, all the partners uh, from Falling Walls are joining this festival, this virtual festival again. Uh, this is uh, quite surprising that everybody is aboard again, right? Well, as a matter of fact, this was quite a challenge. And I must say, we are very, very glad that all the partners said, go for it, try it uh, in a digital way, try a new format. We will be your partner also this year. And one of the partners is the uh, city of Berlin, the state of Berlin. And we are happy that we received a greeting remark from the governing mayor of Berlin, Michael Müller. Here it comes. Vom 1. bis zum 10. November werden wir auch in diesem Jahr die Science Week in unserer Stadt erleben, aber eben nicht nur. Durch diese besondere Situation, in der wir uns ja nun alle befinden durch Corona, wird es diesmal eine neue, eine andere Science Week sein. Im virtuellen Raum, im hybriden Raum wird es über 200 verschiedene Angebote geben, Diskussions- und Begegnungsmöglichkeiten. Über die digitalen Möglichkeiten werden alle die Chance haben, praktisch jede Diskussion, jedes Forum mitzuverfolgen. Ich kann Sie alle nur einladen, seien Sie mit dabei, seien Sie mit dabei, dieses spannende Format zu erleben. Gerade in diesen Zeiten wird deutlich, wie wichtig Wissenschaft und Forschung sind, wie wichtig der gemeinsame Austausch um einen guten Weg ist. Viel Spaß! Viel Erfolg und gute Erkenntnisse bei dem, was wir alle im Rahmen dieser diesjährigen Science Week sehen und erleben werden. So, the program has a huge diversity with more than 200 partner events. Uh, Mr. Mlune, can you help us get a first impression? Well, um, we have topics um, out of the area of uh, Biomedicine, of course, uh, we can't neglect, you know, COVID-19. So there is quite uh, something on COVID-19, how uh, um, the vaccine research develops, uh, what kind of lessons we have learned already now out of this uh, uh, pandemic situation. We will have new technologies like uh, quantum technology, uh, but uh, of course also the future of computing in general, high performance computing, neuromorphic computing. We will have environmental science. You know, forests are burning all over the world. What does this do to the climate? Water, a big issue. There will be also uh, discussions on the water issue. We will have uh, also uh, topics like racial discrimination in science. Um, we will have science diplomacy. So I think there will be a lot of, of uh, activity. There will be a lot of topics. And uh, probably at the end, the challenge will be to make a selection. <laughs> and that's what we really want. Yeah, that's, it's really Make hard. it hard to I mean, everybody who is joining us. <laughs> right. And where can we find you during the next nine days? Well, you know, I'm a quantum physicist by training. So I will be here and there in a coherent superposition state. Um, uh, I, I have a stage myself tomorrow on the quantum flagship uh, of the European Union. But of course, I would say the charm of, of these uh, events is that you can also go there where you are a non-expert. So I think I will skip through. Yeah, like a lot of people will do probably. Hopefully. Thank you so far, Mr. Munich. Thank we'll talk you. to you later. Well, we have heard that uh, we will dive deep into the fascinating world of science during the next days. And uh, what many people um, are not expecting, science is also in the arts. 
Among the incredible programs this year, we will show you virtually several great exhibitions. And one remarkable example is the Hypertopia. It's a real avant-garde exhibition, the intersection between science and arts. Let's have a look now at um, the Hypertopia and meet Christian Rauch. He is the executive director of State Studio. Building bridges between tomorrow and today between science and art. With its transdisciplinary exhibition Hypertopia, Berlin-based State Studio offers a new thought-provoking approach. How could a post-crisis future look like and what does this mean for the present moment? We meet the curator Christian Rauch in his exhibition hall where he explains the concept in more detail. Hypertopia explores through artistic positions and scientific um, explorations the uh, post-crisis future where we have managed to find a different way of how to interact with our global surrounding, with um, the sp species that we cohabit our planet with. And by showing artistic positions that act as pockets of hope, we want to inspire through this exhibition a different way of uh, engaging with our environment. We are featuring um, 10 artists in um, seven artworks. Hypertopia is more than just an exhibition. It is a program which wants to inspire discussions and encourage people to exchange ideas with one another. Field trips to exciting urban spaces in Berlin and digital events are also offered. It is also worth mentioning that we do not try to propose Hypertopia as a unique concept and a unique curatorial concept on its own. Much rather, we try to interlink our exhibition with the many other artistic and scientific initiatives that are out there already that deal very much with the same question of systemic change and propose new modes of understanding. With an artistic approach, the project wants to encourage people to think about their relation to nature and her preservation. The biggest question that we are dealing with with this exhibition is one of the biggest questions of our time. It's the question of our relationship with this planet and its myriad life forms you know, that, that inhabit it. And how we need to change and how we need to change our actions in order to find a sustainable way that will allow positive and, and hopeful future, not only for us, but also for, for, for the many other life forms on this planet. The project wants to challenge hierarchies examine new ideas and inspire people to think about new optimism in society, not only locally, but globally. There are ways that we can contribute to a change in this world. Opening a space for people to come together, artists and scientists and, uh, and people from the general public that are all interested and, and motivated and concerned alike with what our future might bring and how we Need to need to adapt and change our ways of dealing with our surrounding and ask questions. We, we don't really have answers to, to all of this as a, as a species yet of how we need to go forward in order to, to find uh, ways for, for, for a sustainable future. But it's only through the coming together, it's only through collectiveness, it's only through exchanging with each other and bringing different viewpoints on into one space, such as, for example, a space of this exhibition, and finding formats for people to interact with each other, that we can find such answers. So if you want to visit the exhibition, please check in advance in the internet if it's really going to be open due to the current pandemic restrictions going on. In any case, uh, there are many virtual opportunities to follow this great exhibition. So we have got many great partners joining the summit and one of the partners is the Tohoku University in Japan with an event that tries to find out how science can make societies more resilient against disasters. 
Professor Igawa is joining us now virtually. Hello, good afternoon or good evening, I must say, since uh, it's late night in Japan, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Professor Igawa is a specialist on hazards and their effects on human health. He helped develop an important framework for disaster risk reduction after the 2011 earthquake in Japan. Um, Mr. Igawa, being specialized on disasters and hazards, what is your take on the extraordinary year 2020? I am a medical doctor and uh, the professor of disaster medicine. This year is a disaster. We are taking COVID-19 pandemic as a disaster. It was originally the Olympic and the Paralympic year, and they were postponed, and this disaster is still ongoing. Usually people do not think infectious disease as a disaster, but this is a disaster. There is a wall between disaster medicine and general medicine, but COVID-19 break the wall. So disaster is a function of health and uh, hazard and vulnerability and coping capacity. So Japan has many hazards, but at the same time, we have the longest life expectancy. And I investigated why they negatively correlate uh, namely that long life expectancy, low disaster risk. So Japan has some risk reduction against disaster and infectious disease. So if you compare COVID-19 to the earthquake in 2011 in Japan, do you see parallels? Uh, have you learned something from uh, 2011 that we can apply to today? Yes. As if we think the pandemic a disaster, we can reduce the disaster risk. And one of the uh, risk reduction is the national disaster medical system, including a disaster-based hospital and disaster medical assistant team uh, called DMAT. Although DMAT is not uh, supposed to respond to the infectious disease in the front line, but they did so because they have a passion and also they are trained uh, to protect themselves against the CBRNE, such as biological hazard is included, such incident. So that uh, this is a, one of the strong point of Japan. And when the Great East Japan earthquake happened in 2011, so these DEMA teams uh, rescued many lives. Mr. Igawa, if we look more general, how do you see the role of science uh, in preparing society um, for any future disasters? Yes, uh, they usually the disaster scientists are thought that they are working only on the disastrous hazards, but they are not. They are working on the society the resilience of the society and how to outreach to the society or policy makers. So the scientists have to be proactive or uh, outreaching so that the community understands or policy makers understands the meaning of the science very well. Uh, could you explain, please, Mr. Igawa, what your event during the Berlin Science Week is about, actually? Thank you very much. We are talking about the disaster risk reduction from the broader sense of disaster science. We are talking about the people's perception and mindset when they faced a large scale disaster, such as 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and 2019 COVID-19 pandemic. Earthquake and virus are different hazards, but the society's confusion is very similar and the damage to the society are very similar. So people lose their beloved family and friends, huge economic loss and experienced confusion of the society, including the infodemic. So we have to be uh, more uh, transdisciplinary action and uh, how we are talking, how we perceive disaster and how we cope with it. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Egawa. It was a pleasure talking to you, and we're looking forward to your session. Well, as we see, uh, there are many surprises, many amazing facts and figures coming up during uh, the Berlin Science Week, Mr. Mlunek. Um, one format we developed uh, are the falling wall circle tables. What is this formal act format actually about? Well, normally we have uh, a format, the falling wall circle, uh, where on November 8, we gather a crowd of, let's say, 60 uh, really key people out of science, research, and innovation to talk about, you know, in a, in a, a closed uh, uh, environment about some uh, key issues of the future. Last year, the topic was moonshots, you know, mm -hmm. do we need these big type of projects? And uh, if, you, if you go for something like that, uh, what kind of mistakes should you avoid? This year we said, Maybe that's not the right format to have 60 people together for a couple of hours. It won't work. So we said, let's have little events, circle tables, as the name already says, three to four panelists, professionally moderated on topics that are really, you know, um, of relevance. So to give an example, one would be on circular economy, as a matter of fact, where uh, people are talking about how to avoid carbon footprints. That's also a big issue for uh, private companies, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have something on um, CERN, you know, this particle factory in Geneva. What will be the next big machine be? That's really a multi-billion dollar business. Do we need it? And if so, how would it look like? We would have something, of course, on um, science in a multilateral world. I think that could be of interest, too. After the presidential elections in the U.S., there will be a table with former ministers of China, of science, China, uh, Russia, uh, the chief scientific advisor of the Obama administration and uh, Mrs. Chavan, our former science minister. So again, it's a, it's, it's a, a big diversity of things. And I think we have more than 20 circle tables with high-level talks. Right. What are your favorites? <laughs> well, I mean, again, uh, there is something that is closer to my heart, which is related to technology. I'm a physicist by training. So, for example, artificial intelligence in uh, industrial environment. But I also think this uh, circular economy is, is really interesting. For companies like BASF, it's a big challenge. And there will be a discussion with someone who uh, heads an alliance to end plastic waste and uh, a person from the European Commission. Mm -hmm. So the focus will be on plastic, but it's more on how can we organize a circular economy. What else do we have on the agenda in the next 24 hours? Well, I think there will be another uh, table, uh, one on vaccine research, COVID-19. There will be people from uh, a company working on biotechnology, Sartorio, someone from Lonza, uh, a biomedical company, and a scientist, uh, Carlos Gutzmann, who is an expert in vaccine research. And I think everybody is, you know, looking either for a vaccine or for a drug related to COVID-19. So if you want to uh, learn more about it, just join us. Yeah, that's really highly interesting. Thank you so much, Mr. Blunek, for you. giving us an overview and an outlook. Uh, it was a pleasure having you with us in the studio today. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, Many of the Berlin Science Week programs are tackling grand challenges uh, that we're facing globally, as Mr. Mlunik just mentioned. Uh, and one of the biggest is uh, our use and storage of energy. The Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin is working on innovative solutions, researching entirely new materials using BESI-2, their powerful particle accelerator. We spoke with Tristan Petit on the thrills of supporting the shift towards sustainable sustainability using revolutionary nanomaterials. Have a look.
In the southeast of Berlin in Adlershof, the Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin operates BESI-2, a particle accelerator which produces extremely bright X-ray light. BESI-2 is the only German synchrotron radiation source that generates this so-called soft X-ray light, which is why researchers from all over the world come to Berlin for their studies at Helmholtz Zentrum. One of them is Dr. Tristan Pitti, who uses BESI-2 for his prize-winning studies on new materials for storing electrical energy. So I'm working on a new class of material called Maxine, which are very interesting for new type of uh, energy storage system. And especially I'm using the synchrotron BC2 to try to understand how energy can be stored in such materials. But how does the particle accelerator work? BC2 is both an X-ray microscope and a slow motion camera. In the middle, you can see the so-called synchrotron that accelerates electrons to almost the speed of light. On the outside is the electron storage ring with recurring magnetic zones. When the electrons pass through these, the X-ray flashes needed for research are created. We use these X-rays either to analyze the chemistry of a material or the structure of such materials. And for that, there are different techniques available which are sitting around this big ring where we are measuring a few times per year. My, my research is basically a, an example of what we can do uh, with the light that comes out from BC and how we can use it to understand uh, problems that are relevant for many uh, users from all around the world are coming to measure. In my case, I usually work through collaboration. So I have collaborators who send me samples and we analyze their samples with the techniques we are developing here. Round about 2,000 scientists like Tristan PT come to BESI2 each year. At the various beam lines in the experimental hall, they can do their research using the brilliant light the particle accelerator offers. So the use of this X-ray uh, makes the method very particular. For example, in my case, I was looking with battery materials, which may have a lot of different elements. And using an X-ray, we can look at each of these elements separately and analyze, for example, only oxygen atoms, only titanium atoms. And this is not possible with uh, other techniques than X-ray spectroscopy. With the help of BESI-2, Dr. Petit is researching the new material group Maxines. They can store and deliver large amounts of electrical energy extremely quickly and therefore might play an important role in future energy storage, especially in the context of renewable energy. We want to see inside this particle chemical reaction happening during charging and discharging, like in a battery, small battery system. So this is very challenging because we have to uh, probe the different atoms and we also have to focus the X-ray of a very tiny uh, amount, I mean, very tiny space. So especially this particle of a few microns and using X-ray microscopy, we can focus the X-ray over a few tens of nanometer, which is extremely small. So the biggest challenge is, as, is combining this uh, X-ray microscopy techniques, which have not been done for liquid measurement, into uh, a cell which simulates a real battery environment. And this has to be done uh, in liquid. And these two worlds of uh, X-ray microscopy, which works in vacuum, and of a battery which works in an electrolyte, so which can be water or an, another type of electrolyte, is very challenging and hasn't been done so much. So what I hope is that thanks to my research, we may understand better how this material could be a game changer in the battery world. And hopefully in 10 years from now, there would be such new materials in every uh, battery that we have around. And I would hope that my techniques contributed a little to this development. On November 2nd, Ingo Miller from the Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin will virtually present the particle accelerator in German. Afterwards, there will be a Q&A session.
So that was one example, one spotlight we set for our program. There are many, many more interesting sessions coming up. And here during the highlight session, we want to give you an overview about what you can expect. Felix Rondel is joining me again, the executive director of Falling Walls. Felix, what's coming up in the next 24 hours here on the program? Yeah, you know, Astrid, you just discussed with Jürgen uh, about the diversity of the topics that we have, but there's also a great diversity of the formats that we have within the Berlin Science Week at the mm -hmm. summit this year. So we have big events, small events, game events, social media events, uh, panels. And uh, yes, what this uh, session is all about is giving our audience an overview and a way to structure their calendars uh, throughout the 10 days. So my first um, highlight for Today, actually, following right after the session at 2 p.m., is uh, the Entropy Mastermind game. And uh, it's incredible how creative uh, the organizers um, are in coming up with digital solutions uh, this year. This one is a game-based workshop on um, the differences between human and artificial intelligence. And so what we know uh, on a superficial level, um, AI is better at faster calculations and at making sense of big data, but human intelligence is much better at working with messy data. And so what researchers are trying to do is find out how they co can combine characteristics of human intelligence with AI to make the AI stronger. And what the, the organizers here um, of University of Surrey are doing is um, inviting everyone, and there's a, a top, uh, 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 well, uh, um, there's a top uh, seat uh, number of 300, so make sure you get there fast. Um, they invite uh, all of our audience to join in a game of mastermind, um, to play against an opponent and find out uh, a color code or a, a code, and uh, in the meantime, understand how different um, human intelligence and computer intelligence works. Okay, here we get something else uh, in the background. We see the quantum week. Exactly. Can you tell and, us about this? And this is the very, uh, it shows the difference between the projects. This one is an entire festival within the festival. Mm -hmm. So uh, the European Quantum Week is a basically a festival um, to inform about the quantum flagship. Um, and if you haven't heard about it yet, it's a 10-year mammoth project by the European Commission equipped with a billion euros to build a competitive quantum technology industry. And this event um, goes on for several days. And what we have tomorrow is the opening event. It's open to the public and it features a lot of top-level speakers from the European Commission, from the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, of course, also Jürgen Mlinek, who was just here. Uh, he's the chair of the Strategic Advisory Board. Um, and there are also other prominent figures like uh, Nobel laureate Serge Arroche. So if you want to get up to date on the latest in European quantum technology, you should definitely not, not miss this. OK, great. That sounds exciting. So what else do we have? Well, the last uh, spotlight I want to bring here today is uh, something that is one of my favorites. Um, it's also today at 4 p.m. And this is called Inclusivity and Diversity in Science, Meet the Heroes. It's organized by the Aga Khan University Medical College in Karachi, um, a great international partner. And it brings on the topic of um, inclusion in science. So one thing we've learned uh, from many Falling Walls talks as well is that um, to create breakthroughs in science, it's important to have diverse teams. Um, but still, there's not a level of diversity in science yet, as high as it could be. So this uh, event brings together experts, top level um, doctors, researchers to discuss um, inclusivity. And uh, what's special about this event is that there are um, several doctors. Um, the first Arab deaf doctor from Cairo, Dr. El Babli. Um, Dr. Durno is a deaf doctor at the St. Thomas Hospital in London and a blind artist, Erika Tendori. So this should be very interesting to learn about this topic. Mm -hmm. Great. Did you bring something else? Yes. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, of course, a lot of different programs coming up in the next 24 hours. And um, the 
One uh, other uh, program that I want to highlight is by uh, the Los Angeles Pacific University. It's called Making Learning Fun or Make Learning Fun. And this is a uh, competition, a learning competition, which you can join online to learn about diverse um, strategies to get better at learning. And uh, this basically um, is a competition where you end up uh, uh, making a, a learning journey and if you're good you can end up on the leaderboard. Um, so this is uh, going on for uh, 4 to 8 p.m. today and also very interesting to join. Um, the next one is 1001 Inventions. It's a partner that has been doing events at the Berlin Science Week for the several uh, past years. And this, were, this year it's going digital as well with a program called The World of Ibn al-Haytham. And uh, this is a social media event, so you have to visit the Berlin Science Week website, find uh, the instructions, and then you can learn. Um, basically, it's for teenagers. You can learn about uh, this uh, story of 11th century science pioneer Ibn al-Haytham <laughs> and uh, learn about some principles of optics and light and vision. It's interesting. <laughs> Um, an event that also goes in the vein of the quantum uh, tech that is all over the Berlin Science Week is the Quantum Future Academy. It's hosted by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research here in Germany and the Quantum Flagship. And this project brings together 60 participants, um, undergraduates and MA students to explore quantum technology um, with field trips and uh, visits, uh, virtual formats this year, um, and creates the next generation of quantum leaders. And last but not least, there's a gap in mind, the lab. So the Paul Drude Institute has been organizing um, outreach activities with uh, Mind the Lab in Berlin subway stations in the past years. And now this is no longer possible, obviously. But instead, they were creative and used, they, uh, they have a light installation in front of the Paul Drude Institute, not far from here at Hausfugteilplatz in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So Berliners can go there uh, in the evening hours from 5 to 11 in the next days and experience a wonderful visual and sound installation, Unibirds, in uh, cooperation with the Embassy of Colombia. And this installation brings to the Berlin night the tropical biosphere of Colombia with bird voices and natural sounds. Well, it sounds so lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Felix. Uh, it's really a pleasure just to listen. I'm really excited to see all this and, and hear all this. So we have a wide range of topics, as you can see, many fascinating sessions. So don't miss to configure your personal program. It's easy to do. We have a calendar function. Just go on our platform, you'll find the button, and you can block time for your personal program and, uh, and see what are your favorites. So, another highlight in our program are the daily short interviews with Herlinde Köbel. She is an internationally celebrated photographer from Germany. She is a fascinating personality. She's taking great, great pictures. Here is a picture of her. And Felix, you talked to her, you know her since long, and you helped her with an amazing project she just set up. What is it about? Yes, this project is called Fascination Science. It's her latest ph photography project. And for it, uh, Helinda traveled all over the world to meet the most influential scientists and thought leaders, take uh, portraits of them and interviewed them for a book that just came out. And it uh, also was joined by an exhibition um, at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. And in this book, she basically brings out all the personal, personal stories of the scientists, how they were brought up, what motivated them, what dr uh, drove them uh, during their creation of the breakthroughs. And yeah, she's a great uh, talent in bringing out these personal stories. And so this is what we did with her. We interviewed her uh, and have short segments for each of the 10 days in which she talks about one portrait and one story of a particular scientist. And she has a great sense of humor, I think. Uh, so have a look uh, at her little portraits. Hey Linda, the portrait we are looking at today is of Jennifer Doudna. She's an American biochemist who, together with her colleague Emmanuel Charpentier, discovered the gene editing tool CRISPR-Cas9. And this year, both of them won the Nobel 
prize for it. What's the story behind this picture? Jennifer grew up in Hawaii and she was always different. She was taller than the others. Her eye color was different. Her hair color was different. And she was isolated. And she felt lonely and felt like a nerd and buried herself in books. And later on, she told me this feeling propelled her to science because it's very important to go your own way and you accept that you're different than the others. And she was very dedicated in science. She's married, had a son. And she told me, you know, even so when I changed diapers with my son, uh, I was thinking about my research. It was just occupied every thoughts in her mind. 2011, she met Emmanuel Charpentier in Puerto Rico, and then they made a collaboration and they both uh, researched about CRISPR-Cas9. And as we know, it was very successful. And now she received the Nobel Prize for this long time research. So in the next days, we will feature one portrait every day and we will share the stories and the pictures Helena brought back from her journeys. So that was the highlight session for today. Um, now check out the calendar function, get ready for joining outstanding sessions and meet amazing speakers and leading figures from the academic world. So something else uh, you should not miss are the brain dates. This is a great uh, feature we are offering as well. It's our net form, network platform, which you can join and you can easily find it on our platform, I think. And there is a lot of traffic going on, Felix, exactly. right? Exactly. Last time I checked, there were more than 600 people online already with a lot of anticipation and connections being made. We have a lot of brain dates already set up, group brain dates of uh, five people and individual brain dates. So this is a feature that shouldn't be missed for really, well, replacing what um, the networking the conference had in last years. This is all going to happen digital and um, please check it out. Yeah, looking forward. So that was our highlight session for today. We'll see you again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, German time and we're looking forward meeting you and showing more of our program. Thanks a lot for joining us. Goodbye and auf Wiedersehen from Berlin. <laughs>